The honoree in 2013 for Atheist of the Year was someone who can tell you all about how hard it can be to come out, but why that is a struggle that is necessary. That's a struggle that we, some of us have higher burdens than others, but it's a struggle that we all need to fight. Teresa McBain was a pastor for a long time and she's worked in this movement and she is someone who is going to join us now were I not um, having a hard time saying, oh, yay, there you go, yay. So Teresa McBain is someone who absolutely uh, can share with us her struggles, her joys, and her atheism. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Teresa. <laughs> okay, I'm sure I have a timer somewhere. It's been drilled. Oh, there it is. And you're coming to teach me how to use everything. Okay, cool. Hey guys, how are you? I guess I've lost practice with having a podium in front of me and a microphone and having to, to fiddle with the podium because, you know, I was a Methodist pastor and so we always had most of the time this enormous, this is very small, but this enormous pulpit and I had to come up with my stately, godly, honorable robes in my stole and, and stand and be so nice and wonderful. Three years ago, you know, I stood and had a, a jacket on. And every time I've talked, for the most part since that time, I've had on a suit, my one of my preacher suits. I'm happy to say now that those things are in the past. I don't have preacher suits anymore. They're gone. And I'm slowly, slowly trying to change a wardrobe that's not quite so uh, drab, maybe. You know, I actually got rid of the, some of you didn't even recognize me because I got rid of the preacher hair. I got rid of the hair that is short and co close cropped, so I fit in more closely with a male-dominated religious structure. Um, it's necessary. I mean, you, you all know that, that there is so much that's put on in order to be successful uh, for men, but for women as well, especially, um, that you have to almost fit the mold. Well, no, I don't have that anymore. My hair is now long. It's dark again. That's the color I was born with and should have had, although most of you knew me as a highlighted or com almost completely blonde. Um, but that all goes to, to, the, to show you just parts of not only my religious past as a pastor, but the fundamentalist childhood that I had, growing up with an extremely strict father who was a Baptist pastor. Of course, he was in Southern Baptist Convention, but my grandmother always referred to him as a hard shell Baptist. Uh, growing up, that was just the way life was. I didn't know any different, but now I realize what hard shell Baptist was. It's, it's exactly the things that I'm going to talk to you about today in this talk, seven things I can't say as a hashtag former fundy. So take out your phones or your computers or whatever and be prepared to tweet. Make sure you use that hashtag, former fundy. Okay, got it? Everybody ready? No? Yes? Sleep? Yeah, come on, be active. Pretend like we're in a Pentecostal church, okay? No, no, praise you Jesus. No, 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 no. Don't get carried away. Goodness gracious. Just be active. If you want to dance though in the aisles, go ahead. Who cares? Go ahead. It's fine. Um, now, some of you probably had a thought when you first either read or saw on Facebook or Twitter or looked at the slide and saw seven things I can't say. You either thought two things. One, of the George Carlin skit, seven dirty words you can't say on TV. By the way, I can only say two of those, and I can't watch it at all yet. Got to look. Yeah, those are bad words. Goodness gracious. Or you may have been thinking she's a former pastor, so it's, it's Holy Week, you know, it's almost Easter, she's going to talk about the seven sayings of Christ from the cross, right? Wrong on both accounts. Wrong, completely wrong, especially since I don't even know those seven words, I can't watch the video, and I don't want you to tell me either, so just keep it to yourself. <laughs> you don't get froggy on me and say, oh, by the way, Teresa, here's the seven words. No, don't want to know. What am I talking about? I'm not talking about dirty words. I'm talking about seven words 
that are damaging messages, that have lifelong consequences. They have had f consequences for me, but for any child that is raised in a, that indoctrinated fundamentalist, and we were evangelical background, and it may be Christian fundamentalism, it could be Muslim, it could be any religious belief that is extremely fundamentalist. It causes harm that is very, very difficult to overcome. One article that I read, a, a report, said that people who come out of fundamentalism successfully and even move beyond, away from religion and religious belief altogether, are extremely rare. So if you're sitting out there today listening to me, and you've been in the same type of background and grown up in a very fundamentalist religious organization, whether it be Pentecostal or, or Baptist, I almost forgot what I was raised in. That's pretty good, huh? A Baptist or whatever, you can consider yourself special because you're very rare. We are very rare to have escaped the, the hold that is put upon a person when that's been just drilled into your head, hammered, and for a lot of you like me, whose dads believe spare the rod, spoil the child, beaten into you. So let's talk about my seven words. My first word is going to be your favorite, I think, out of the whole show. Sex. Yes. Nobody likes sex in this room. I mean, really. Don't, 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 and don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to Daryl Ray on you up here. No ducks allowed. They're out there in the lobby. Okay? No ducks in this. Uh -uh. And I did read his book. And David Fitzgerald is in here too. And he's not going to come up here and, and talk all sexy-like. And I'm going to dance around. I was Baptist. You don't dance. Damn it. That's having sex standing up. You know, Sarah Moorhead and Vicki Garrison and I were all raised in a similar background, and we were talking about dancing, and we're like, no, no, we don't dance. I said, we need to come up with a dance and call it the former fundy, something like this, you know? Don't shake the hips, though. Uh-uh, and definitely don't do any of that stuff. Oh, no, baby, uh-uh. There's a reason why I always played piano at church, because then I was sitting down and hiding, and I didn't even have to worry about doing anything besides nodding my head. No raising of the hands, you know, none of that stuff. So anyway, I digress. Talking about sex and, and being a former fundamentalist, being a former fundy, it actually takes the shape of three different things. One is obvious. It's sexuality. It's feeling that sex is approved and it's good and it's healthy and that you can have sex with your partner for more than just making babies, that as a woman, that I can choose when and where to have sex, that it's not up to my husband to tell me, okay, tonight is sex night, and you will give it to me. And biblically, I can't refuse him unless we've made a pact to pray together and abstain fast from sex, but that's his decision, not mine. You know, it, it, it deals with those things that are so suppressive and so harmful, but it also deals with two other things. One, of course, is gender. But the other is, is the LGBTQ. And it, the irony of me standing in Memphis and talking about sex and talking about, as the slide says, your desires, preferences, and gender, they're not evil. Here's an ironic thing for you. I don't remember how many years ago because I'm getting close to a big birthday that I don't want to talk about, and I can't remember the date, so I won't say. But my brother is a, a gay man very happily married to his partner, but that hasn't been the case for his entire life. So he was raised in the same crazy fundamentalist evangelical beliefs that I was raised in. And around 04, don't quote me on that, we brought him to Memphis, Tennessee to a treatment center called Love in Action. It was a reparative therapy center in Memphis that is no longer open, it has been closed down for years. Yeah. We believed and he believed that he was possessed, that he was cursed, that he was wrong, that he was evil, that he was a bad person and that God had to rid him of his gayness. That only through prayer and only through fasting and only through 
him being fully committed and being faithful to God and doing everything just right, could he be rid of that horrible scourge known as homosexuality? And I, I say it funny, but God, I'm so ashamed of myself. My brother was strong, though. He went through that whole time. And somewhere around, I don't know, the 12th, 15th, 18th week of it, he suddenly realized, you know what? I don't understand all this, but I was born this way. This is me. I don't choose to love a man. I love men no more than my sister chooses to love men, except we both think men are attractive, so it's a little weird. But um, this is who I am, and, and, and I don't know what God said about it or what God didn't say about it, and frankly, I don't give a shit. I'm a gay man. That's one of the words I can say, by the way. I am a gay man, and he checked himself out of that place and left Memphis, Tennessee, acknowledging I'm gay, and if you don't like it, and if you don't like it, oh well, I'm, that's fine with me. So sex talks about our desires, it talks about our sexual preferences, and, and as women, we know the messages that it tells us, that, that we've heard that for years. Women keep silent, women are submissive, women must offer their husband sex whenever they want. Women, poor Eve, oh my goodness, she was tempted and she was weak and she fell, and because of her horrible sin, she brought it and gave it to, gave the apple, the fruit, whatever, to Adam. And because of all that, women are cursed, and we have to have babies, and it hurts really, really bad, and we have that special time of the month that's, that men don't have, and it's all because we were weak and sinful, and so we are cursed. No, that's not true at all. Women are strong. <laughs> women, thank you. We don't believe that anymore. As a former fundy, I am learning that being a woman is a wonderful thing that I can love being a woman. The fact that I'm not wearing preacher suits anymore means that I am finally accepting and being feeling comfortable in my skin as a, as a woman, as an equal, as an intelligent, creative person. Sex is, one of the, is the first thing that, as a former fundy, that was one of the words that I struggled with, but the reality is, is that I'm moving past that. And I hope each of you who have been formerly fundamentalists are moving past it as well. Accepted. This is a tough one. And you're sitting there going, accepted? Okay, what does that have to do with being fundamentalist? It has to do with the fact that behavior is controlled through a, a clever technique saying that everything you do has to be acceptable to God. You have to live a life that is acceptable to God. And if you're not acceptable to God, and if the things that you're doing are an abomination or, or even just a tiny little, tiny little sin, I, I don't know, maybe you forgot to say, God bless you when somebody sneezed, I don't know, then you're no longer acceptable. And so acceptance is, is immediately tied to how you behave in relation to a set of rules that are laid out before you that are tied to a deity that is controlling everything and either giving you the thumbs up, which is good, or the thumbs down, which is bad, which is actually really, really, really bad. And as a child, you don't understand all of that. You know that you want to be accepted. You want people to care for you and to see you as a valuable person. And when you don't feel that, or you feel like you have to perform in order to earn it, it messes with your brain. It screws your head up really bad. So accepted is a word I have struggled with and haven't felt valuable and haven't felt worthy because God alone is worthy, right? I haven't felt good. But the reality is, is that we, I, you are all good. We are all valuable, extremely valuable, and we are all worthy. We don't have to perform to make some, some cosmic superhero like us. We have that inherent within us. We are human beings and we should take pride in that. <laughs> this word, I didn't even realize this was a word that I struggled with until about a year or so ago, I went through the Secular Therapy Project and 
was connected with a, a therapist in Montana. And he and I began having phone conversations every week. And he asked me at one point about this idea of being feeling precious. Um, and I, I, it didn't even dawn on me to even think about the word precious. And moving the question forward, have you ever felt precious? Have you ever felt, has anyone ever said that you're precious? Have they said that, that just because of, of uh, what is within you that you are worthy of love? And I had to answer honestly, no. Because being worthy of love, being worthy of acceptance, again, is dictated by how I behave and how I perform and how I look and how I act in public and how good I serve and how much I sacrifice and give and how much money I put into the plate. So preciousness was never a thing that really crossed my mind until that time about a year ago. And religion has taught us, and, ha and, and it's been proven psychologically there is a connection between religion and that feeling of being loved and comforted and wanted and protected and cared for. But when that is altered by these messages that are embedded in a, a young child's soft, shapeable, moldable, vulnerable mind, that those things are tied to how you relate to your God, how you relate to the authority figures in your life, how well you behave or misbehave, uh, which I was always the behaving kind, because I wanted to feel good about myself. When those are skewed, you don't feel loved and cherished for who you are. But the reality is, is that that's, that's not how we are. We don't have that tie. We don't have to perform for anybody, the, you know, the guy upstairs. We are precious. You are precious. Maybe you're like me and you're sitting there and nobody's ever told you that, that you are absolutely 100%, a thousand times a thousand times a thousand precious, irreplaceable. Nobody can take your place. If no one's ever said that to you, then I'm saying that to you today. You are precious. You are loved and you are cherished just because of who you are. We have a voice. This is, a, again, a huge struggle. And you can, you can see the slide and tell exactly what I'm going to say because religion tells us that we don't have a right to speak up. You, you don't have a right to think your own thoughts, to say your own words, to, to feel your own emotions, to make your own judgments. It's all about what God wants. It's all about what your parents want. You know, I can remember my dad spanking me numerous times, especially when I was really young. You know, take his belt off, and I'm being spanked for something, and he's like, don't you cry. Don't you cry. Now, how the heck does that work? I mean, really, I am getting my little rear end spanked for practically nothing, really, and I'm not supposed to cry. What is that teaching a child? It's teaching that child to stifle all those emotions, to silence that voice, to not be able to speak out and say, this is me, this is who I am, this is how I feel, this is what I believe, this is where I'm struggling. No, those things are not allowed. The, 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 the voice that you have is the voice that you're told. The things that you say are the things that you're told to say. They're the things that are acceptable to say. They're dictated to you by your Sunday school teachers, your pastors, your Bible, your Quran, whatever your holy book is. It's a rigid set of words which strips us away of our entire identity, starting with our voice. The reality is, is that's not true at all. Just like the other words, you can speak. You do have a voice. You have control over over the things that you think and do. You have a control over your purpose. You don't have to wait for God to call you to do something. You don't have to ignore your own true talents and, and skills and abilities because it's much better for you to be a missionary and serve in Africa and give up yourself for the, the glory of God. No. You happen to be good at science, so you can be, become a science teacher or a scientist, and you can work at, oh my goodness, God forbid, UC Berkeley. That is the devil's playground, I have to tell you. It is really. You don't want to go there. You need to teach at Bob Jones University. When we do those things, when we strip that away, it's almost like we make our life an Ikea project. Does anybody have Ikea furniture? I have two Ikea chairs. Oh my God. 
you get the box home and you open it up and it is like 50 gazillion pieces and Allen wrenches. A huge book of directions that nobody understands, not even the people who made it. And it takes you hours and hours and hours to put it together. It's, it's an incredibly difficult, almost nearly impossible task with a rule book that is so, it's just impossible. Sounds very similar to someone trying to put their life together with mismatched parts and pieces that don't really fit you, but you're doing it because the rule book tells you to do so. No. The reality is, is you've got a voice. Use it. Stand up for yourself. Speak up for yourself because you're worth it. And your voice is needed. We need to hear your voice. Just as much as you're sitting and listening to mine, I need to hear your voice as well. Pride. Oh, my goodness. Pride. That's what the that's what Lucifer got in trouble for. Oh, he was so proud. And he, oh, man, God kicked him out of heaven with a ton of angels, too. I mean, threw them down on the face of the earth. That's why he's tormenting us now, by the way, is because he was so full of pride. Pride was a sin. I mean, pride goeth before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. <laughs> I got a Bible verse in on you. You absolutely, I warped that to mean that I could not even feel that I could accomplish anything. Of course I couldn't because God was giving it all to me. I mean, I didn't accomplish anything. It was just that I was behaving right and I had enough faith and I prayed hard enough and I fasted and I studied. And okay, so yeah, God did it. But oh, I'm, I'm just so humble. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's all God. Oh, it's all Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for helping me to win this Oscar award today. Oh, yes, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. Oh, Hallelujah. Y'all are not very Pentecostal right now. If we were in church, I mean, you'd be like, oh, yeah, Lord, give it a glory, give it a glory. That's, that's the screwed up message, though. I can accomplish. I can achieve. I can attain. And when those things happen, I can be proud. It's such a hard thing. This is one of the hardest for me, honestly. Because for so many years, everything I did was God working through me. No, it was Teresa working. <laughs> pride is really, really hard. But you all should be proud of yourselves. I don't know you all personally, but I know you're here. And I know that's brave. And I know that it takes courage. And I know that a lot of you came from a similar background that I came from. And let me tell you, you should be proud of that. You should definitely be proud of that. Beauty. Okay, so this goes back to my preacher suits and my short hair. And growing up, no makeup, couldn't cut my hair, straight across bangs, no shorts, definitely. Couldn't swim because boys would be there. And as a woman, I would tempt them to think impure thoughts toward me, you know, no, no mention of what responsibility the guy has for thinking those nasty things in the first place, right? Nah. Which, by the way, they're not nasty. That was just what I would be told. Um, beauty. How many of you honestly struggle, especially based upon your religious past, with feeling that you are beautiful just for you? And I know society throws a bunch in with it too. But I was sheltered. I didn't have a TV. I didn't really know what society said. I just knew that God told me to be modest. Not with the adorning of the hair or the, the braiding of the hair or the wearing of jewelry, but with that quiet and submissive spirit. Obeying my husband. Obeying him, especially when he wanted sex. You know? No. That's not beauty. It, women are put down so much, and even men. In such a restrictive life, we don't feel good and perfect just the way we are. It's a very bad message to send to our children, to send, to have them grow up, as I said earlier, and have the lifelong consequences of, of low self-esteem and self-hatred. I mean, that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. But I'm, I'm telling you all, you are beautiful, absolutely gorgeous, and it's okay to feel that way. And it's okay for me not to wear a suit. It's okay for me to actually have, well, it's kind of like a progress, three years now, and I don't have a suit on, and I actually have a shirt, and it's not buttoned all the way up to my neck. I actually have a, you know, there's a little bit there. Not a whole lot. <laughs> you know. 
My husband's going to watch this and go, oh, my Teresa, you didn't just say that, did you? I was like, eh, okay, whatever. It's okay to feel that way. And that's just that, that's more proof of the mindset that has been so ingrained in me is to even just blush at the thought of it. So you're beautiful. I'm beautiful. We're beautiful. And finally, confidence. Confidence plays into all of them. Confidence is probably one of the biggest ones, especially for me, for me knowing that I can do it, that I am capable. I struggled for some time after I came out and started going on the circuit and, and talking at different places. I was struggling with feeling in didn't feel confident about standing up and giving a talk. I didn't feel confident because you guys are smart. I mean, you're really smart. And you hear lots of smart people talk, and I'm just a, an ex-preacher. I mean, really, what have I got to say? I have, I have no science background. You know, I don't have a history degree or archaeology or any of those things. I just know about the Bible. And, I, and a, a friend told me, he said, hey, do you feel like you gave good sermons when you were a pastor? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I gave good sermons. People were moved and people felt their lives were changed and they were engaged and, you know, yada, yada, yada. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, do you realize that wasn't God? That was you. You studied. You wrote the sermons. You delivered the sermons. Yeah. And it, and it snapped something inside me saying, oh, I can do this. I am capable. I'm not the smartest person in the world, but that's okay. I don't have to be. Who I am is good. It is confident. I can have confidence, and I still struggle with it. It's really, really hard to escape from that kind of a, of a, of a programming from childhood where everything that you do and say and look like and act like and, and live like and who you marry and what you do for your life's calling, when all of that is dictated to you by God, it's really, really hard to move past that. So as we finish up, and as normal, I'm a little chatty, but that's okay. As we finish up, I just want you to remind you, the seven words are not seven dirty words, although if they're, if they're given to a child in a fundamentalist upbringing and an indoctrinated into them, they do become dirty. Sex, accepted, precious, voice, pride, beauty, and confidence. They are not that way for me any longer, and they shouldn't be that way for you. Why is this important? Because so many are still in that place. I'm working as a volunteer with the Recovering from Religion Hotline Project. People call this hotline every day, and they share stories that are so similar to mine, and, it, and even though I lived through it, it breaks my heart. We had a, I had a 12-year-old person call us, a, a young 12-year-old who's living in a fundamentalist home that really could have, been, could have described my own home. Trapped, non-believer, what do I do? A 15-year-old has called several times and is the same situation, very religious parents. He said, my parents will disown me if they find out, and I had no one to talk to until you guys. A college student who is doubting, not sure of which way they're going to go, but they are in a strict conservative religious college. They have no one to talk to. Where do they go? They called the hotline and talked to a call agent. A caller, and I'm going to read this, so forgive me for looking down. One caller said at the end of a call, said, this is the first time I've ever verbalized my atheism. It took me three weeks to get up the courage to call you guys. I'm so glad you're here. Just having somebody to talk to means the world to me. It's possible for us to recognize this corrupt power of fundamentalism and to work to help people come out, to work toward helping children, which we are. We've moved in that direction a lot. Catherine Stewart and others are really working hard in that area. But for us who are adults who've come out of that, what can we do? How can we help? The Hotline Project is one way, but another way is to be open to have, to, for people to talk about it. Make it safe to say, 
I'm struggling with this. This is hard for me. When I became an atheist, I didn't just snap my fingers and, oh, wow, overnight, I'm a critical thinker. I'm rational. I, I have all these science degrees. Oh, yes, look at my wall. It just magically appeared. God must have put it there for me. No, it's a process, and it takes time. I wrote an article for X Communications blog uh, last month, biggest, most hits I've ever gotten, and it was entitled, When an Atheist Misses God. And it was all about the fact that sometimes in life, when my life gets really, really bad, I miss the fact that I, I can't pray, and so my cosmic superhero is going to come and solve the problem for me. So many people said, I'm glad you said that because I don't feel safe to say those things online. It's a reality, but we need to change the reality. We need to accept that these seven words are not dirty words. We need to empower people to, to be better, to grow, and to, to move past it, and we need to support them as they do that. Finally, because Jamila is over here trying to get me off the stage, I've got to give a shout out to American Atheists. For the past three years, they have led the charge in recognizing that those of us who came out of a fundamentalist past are valuable, we are worthy, we are, we are, we are good, we are capable, we can accomplish, we can attain, we have something to offer to the movement. And for three years, three former Fundy women have been honored as the American Atheists, Atheist of the Year. <laughs> Vicki is here. This year's winner, go ahead, stand up, stand up. It's an accomplishment. Sarah Moorhead is here somewhere, I know, she better be. Three women. Yes, thank you. Why am I saying that? Why am I wanting to point them out? Why is it so important that three former fundamentalist women are, were recognized as atheists of the year? Because atheism sees the value, and we are recognizing the fact that all of these seven things that I just said that are so harmful and so hurtful, especially toward women who are put down and beat down and, and sent off into the corner, we as atheists are now saying, uh-uh, nobody puts baby in a corner. <laughs> Thank you.